Welcome back to the podcast, Unbinding the Bible. This is episode 154, The Glory of the Lord, A Christmas Reflection. And on the podcast this week, I would like to share with you a brief reflection or homily, which is just a short sermon that I preached last Christmas Eve at our church. And the passage, as is the case on most Christmas Eve services, is Luke chapter 2, which is the Christmas narrative. And most of you are familiar with that, and I won't actually read it on the podcast here. But what I wanted to do and what I did last year in the sermon and the reason I want to share share it with you here is a focus in on the glory of the Lord that is coming, that the angels proclaim and the shepherds are um, made abundantly aware of. And I really wanted to draw our church's attention into glory, what glory is, what it means that Jesus is the glory of God, and why it is that the shepherds rejoice and that the heavenly host rejoices glory to God in the highest. Um, And so I really think you'll be encouraged by it. I chose to do it this week. We have sort of a shortened week and have extra responsibilities this week as it leads up to Christmas. And so that fits really well for my own schedule. But I also realized that the way I framed this short reflection, I think ties in really well to why our following Jesus through the Sermon on the Mount is such a powerful reality. And hopefully once I share this reflection, I'll be able to reference it back um, in future episodes as we walk through the sermon. And so I just have a few pages of notes. I'm gonna read it. And so hopefully you can engage it as if you were in our church with candles on our Christmas Eve. Um, We had a beautiful service last year, looking forward to something similarly beautiful this year. I hope you have a wonderful Christmas. Um, I wish you all the best and um, spend time with family and with friends. You're in my thoughts and in my prayers and really thankful that you're tuning into Unbinding the Bible. So I offer to you the glory of the Lord, a Christmas reflection. Throughout the Christian tradition, the term glory refers to anything good that is shown and made known. According to Thomas Aquinas, glory is simply goodness made manifest. Glory means any goodness that, when displayed, gains our notice and appreciation. We see this firsthand in Exodus 33 when Moses asks to see the Lord's glory. And the Lord responds by saying, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Exodus 33, 19. The Lord's goodness, then, is inseparably tied to his being gracious and merciful toward people. In fact, all through Scripture, God's glory is attached to his goodness and his determination to do all it takes to dwell among his people. And yet the Lord's words to Moses in the very next verse of Exodus 33 put a bit of a dampener on things. He tells Moses that he will show him his glory, but you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. In other words, at this stage in the Lord's revelation, his goodness is so good and so glorious that Moses wouldn't be able to take it all in. And so the Lord doesn't let Moses or anyone else see it. And it's right here in our inability to see the Lord's face that diminishes how much of his glory we can even experience. For if glory is goodness that we can see, and the Lord is explicitly hiding a part of himself from our sight, then we've not yet beheld his true glory. We've not yet seen his true goodness. We can know all sorts of things about the Lord, what he said or how he acts, but we cannot know him as he actually is unless we can see his face. And so I want you to consider what John later tells us about Jesus. John chapter 1 verses 14 and 18 say, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. 
Remember, glory marks anything good that is shown and made known. Jesus' glory, then, according to John, is God's glory. To see Jesus is to see God. To know Jesus is to know God. To experience Jesus is to experience God. This is why Paul says to the Corinthians, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. In other words, Jesus has perfectly revealed to us all the knowledge of the glory of God. And yet when the shepherds experienced the glory of God in Luke chapter 2, we're told that they were filled with great fear. They were filled with fear because to be in the presence of pure goodness is unsettling. It's not something any of us are used to. To be staring right at glory, to come face to face with pure goodness and to experience it all around you can be a bit overwhelming. And yet the glory the shepherds experienced was merely to announce the birth of the one who would forever define goodness. We do need to notice, though, that this glory of the Lord was not something the shepherds witnessed off in the distance, separate and detached from them. No, Luke tells us that the Lord's glory shone around them. In other words, it enveloped them. It surrounded them. It drew them in. These shepherds found themselves in the midst of God's glory. This, after all, is what the coming of Jesus is really all about. Emmanuel, God with us. God's glory coming to meet us, to draw us into his presence and goodness. And because this is the case, the angel of the Lord assures the shepherds that they have nothing to fear. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Good news. Gospel. A message of joy for all the people. The one who is goodness in the flesh has just been born. God's glory, his goodness and determination to do all it takes to dwell among his people has been born into the world. God's glory is a person. And the good news of great joy will be found in how this person manifests his glory. What he will do to restore all that was lost in the fall. How far he will go to redeem for God people from every tribe and language and people and nation. What he will endure in order to draw us into communion with God. Thankfully, we're not left wondering, because Jesus himself tells us what his glory looks like and how it is that he will draw all people into communion with God. In John chapter 12, Jesus says, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Jesus, of course, is here speaking of his death, of his being lifted up on the cross. And what he's saying is that there is no greater manifestation of goodness anywhere in the world than in God laying down his life for those he's come to save. There is no greater manifestation of goodness than the creator of life embracing death so that those caught in death's grip can live. There is no greater manifestation of goodness than the faithful one suffering so that the unfaithful can be restored. And Jesus says, when people see that, when they see that kind of goodness on display, when they see that glory, all people will be drawn to me. They'll be drawn to that kind of glory, that kind of goodness in a way that truly transforms them. They'll see that God's glory took on flesh became one of us, joined us in our struggle, and willingly gave up everything just to be with us. God's glory, then, isn't just something to look at. It's something that invites us in as participants. And we glorify God when we, filled with and fueled by His Spirit, reproduce a likeness of who He is, a cross-centered likeness, a cruciform likeness. Cruciform, or cross-shaped love, that's God's glory. And you and I glorify God when we embody in our lives the same pattern of cruciform love that Jesus embodied. In fact, this is precisely what it means to be his witnesses. It means that the church testifies, i.e. bears witness, 
to the transforming power of Jesus' cruciform love for them by embodying Jesus' cruciform love for all people. We allow his cruciform love to wash over us, to envelop us, to draw us in, and to transform us so that we not only see cruciform love as goodness, but want to participate in that goodness ourselves. This is why Jesus has come. He's come to reveal the true face of God to the world. He's come to transform the world with his glory, his goodness, his cruciform love. And he's come to call a people who will stand in the midst of his glory and allow him to transform them by it. This is what you and I desperately need today. This is what our world desperately needs too. And it is the way in which we might faithfully join the multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Amen. And I would like to wish you the merriest of all Christmases this year. God bless you. Talk to you next week.